Welcome to First Methodist Mansfield. My name is Michelle Rebel, and I serve as the Director of Adult Discipleship here, and I have some opportunities to share with you today. If you have not participated in one of our Epic of Eden studies, I want to encourage you to check out studying Epic of Eden, Understanding the Old Testament with Pastor Jan starting on January 17th. You will gain fresh insights and understanding and connect the Old Testament to the New Testament to your life today in a whole new way. And ladies, a great way to get to know other women while you grow in your faith is by joining Refresh Women's Ministry. This month, we'll begin studying Galatians and discovering what it looks like to live truly free in Christ. Find out more about these opportunities at fmcm.org slash studies. For the guys, First Methodist men have a great guys' night out planned this month with some delicious food, and Pastor David will be talking with Shane Trotter, author of Raising the Bar. If you're a parent, grandparent, educator, or coach, this would be a great event to come to. For more information, visit fmcm.org slash adult events. If you haven't already, pick up an FYI guide where you can find out everything going on in the life of the church. Thank you for coming to worship today. Now let's worship God together. on you. I hope you like it. You're going to hear it again next Sunday too. We've worked so hard on it. We want to get at least two Sundays out of it. <laughs> My name is Scott. I will be with you for this next hour as we worship together, sing together, pray together. We've got a beautiful anthem and uh, can't wait for you to hear those words as we continue on our journey together in Wesley's Covenant Prayer. Can't wait for you to hear David's message as well. Before we do anything else, let us just stand up and we'll sing our first song, Blessed Assurance. Sing it out loud. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a poor.
remain standing. Good morning. My name is, thank you. Uh, my name is Don. I'm one of the pastors here, blessed by that. And this morning we come to affirm our historic faith, the things in which we believe that are the rock, the center, the one way to express our faith in entirety. So would you join me in the Apostles' Creed this morning? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One of the blessed privileges we have as Christians is to come before God with our prayers and our supplications. For he is our father, a parent, heavenly parent who loves us and finds great joy in our presence with him and our speaking to him. So let us come to God with a special blessing, a feeling of closeness to the one who loves us most. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful, so grateful for your grace, for your love, so grateful for the hope that we have in your grace. And so we lift our voices to you, we lift our hearts to you, we surrender ourselves to you this day, for as we ask, we give, we give ourselves in complete surrender and obedience, in confidence with that blessed assurance. We lift up our prayers, gracious God, for those who struggle, for those who hurt, for those who need healing, for those who need hope. And we offer ourselves, gracious God, as your hands and your feet. We give ourselves to in gratitude and thanksgiving answer those needs that we see and trust in the one who can. For together we pray the prayer that Christ has taught us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Don. I've chosen this next hymn as a response to the Wesley Covenant prayer that we are delving into for the next several weeks. And as children, the, the strongest promise you can make, and may, maybe you know this, is a pinky promise, pinky swear. Is that right, Annie? Is that right? If we pinky promise, pinky swear, I mean, you, that can't be broken, correct? That's the strongest promise we can make. She agrees. She's just smiling, but she agrees. Because we've done it before. We pinky promise, pinky swear, and there is nothing stronger than that. So as adults, we call it a covenant. So we make covenants of marriage. We, there's lots of covenants out there, and God has made a covenant with us. It's like, 
I love you, I give myself to you, I die for you on a cross, what is your response? Let's stand and sing, O Jesus, I have promised. Thank you so much for singing that from your heart. I could tell you meant it. That was a promise that you meant, and I love that. We've got a beautiful song for you, an anthem. Uh, we did it at an Ash Wednesday service, but we didn't do it like this. So this is kind of a new thing that we're trying uh, with, the, with the strings and all. I'm going to ask Roxy, one of my students, to come up. She's a, a junior. No, she's a sophomore there at Mansfield. Yeah, sophomore at Mansfield High School. And I've asked her to come and help out with I Shall Not Want. Uh, these words, uh, it's just, I, ho I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's a popular song that's been around for a while, uh, sung by Audrey Assad, and uh, just really from the heart. And I, th I think it's going to fit well with where we're headed in our covenant prayer of things that, you know, I'm not going to want that. I'm not going to, I don't need that. I'm not going to fear um, and so you'll see. The words are beautiful, and we hope that you enjoy it. Shout out one. the love of my own comfort, from the fear of having nothing, from a life of worldly passion.
Amen. Excuse, excuse me, Sonny. Are we dancing? What are we doing here? Excuse me. Well, I also want to welcome you uh, here today. If we've not met, my name is David. I serve as the senior pastor here. And uh, if you are here in person, those online, we're, just, uh, we're grateful that, uh, that you are here, uh, just as we are grateful for that anthem. We're grateful uh, for Roxy and blessing us with this. Roxy, where'd you put your music? Can I, can I see that? I need it later. I promise. So if, if you were blessed by that song, uh, that is one of my favorites. And so I want to make sure you know, you, you heard Scott say it, that's Audrey, as you would normally spell it, Assad, A-S-S-A-D. Beautiful song. And I'm going to use that later in the message. So I'm going to put that over here. Really good. If you have your Bible, John chapter 15 is where we're going to be. John chapter 15. And as you find that, I want to lift up just a few opportunities we have in the life of our church uh, this week. Many things uh, happening. You've already heard about some Bible studies that are beginning. Uh, but there's three special events that I want to make sure that you are aware of. First, on Wednesday night, uh, we're having a new member dinner. That's for all those who have recently joined our church in the last year uh, or anyone who is uh, thinking about making a membership commitment to our church. Uh, we would love to share a meal with you. Uh, we have a whole lot already registered for that, but if you'd like to join us, if you've not let us know that yet, uh, please do. Uh, we'd, again, we'd love to, to share, share a meal with you. On Thursday... Uh, at lunchtime, we're going to have uh, a luncheon for our Boomers and Beyond group. Now, if you don't know what that is, that is for those who are retired or at retirement age, and you get to decide if you fit into that, okay? No, no one uh, does that for you, uh, but we're going to have a great lunch on Thursday. Would love for you to be here for that, and then you've already heard about Friday night. 
We have Guys Night Out. I'll be interviewing uh, Shane Trotter. Shane is the strength and conditioning coach at Mansfield High School. He's also the author of this book, Setting the Bar. The, the subtitle of this book reads like this, Preparing Our Kids to Thrive in an Era of Distraction, Dependency, and Entitlement. And I hope that subtitle alone expresses why I think uh, Friday night will be so important. Uh, if you're a dad, it, it, it'll be a great thing to, to be a part of. But I also want you to hear, as a family of faith, as we seek to raise up the next generation, I, I think the message that Shane's going to share uh, is, is applicable to us all. And so, guys, I would love for you to be here uh, Friday night for that, uh, that special event. Uh, we are, as Scott already mentioned, we are focusing on the Wesley Covenant Prayer, a historic prayer of the Methodist movement. Uh, in early Methodism, it was a prayer that was shared in the context of an annual service that they did, uh, a service that was focused on recommitting ourselves to live as followers of Christ uh, and to recommit ourselves to the church, to living as God's covenant people. Uh, Wesley described it as a means of increasing serious religion. The first gathering for the Wesley Covenant service took place in 1755 in London with 1,800 participants uh, there as a part of that service. We together on February 5th, we're going to share in the Wesley Covenant service. But we're spending several weeks preparing ourselves for that day for a couple reasons. The first being that while this is a part of our heritage, it has not been a part of our recent tradition. And so we want to be ready for the service that we're going to share. It's going to be a little bit different than our normal weekend worship services, but I hope that you will be here for that special time as we together, as a family of faith, recommit ourselves to Christ, recommit ourselves to the church, and to living as God's covenantal people. But the second reason that we're going to be doing that and we're spending time preparing for that is because as, as we talked about last week, the, the content of this prayer that I'm going to read to you in just a minute, the content is so counter to how we often think at this particular time of the year. Author J.D. Walt expresses it in this way, that this is the month where we're often thinking about how we can try harder how we can do more, how we can reach higher, how we can be better. And we do all this completely ignoring the fact of the lesson that we've learned year after year that we're going to run out of gas by Valentine's Day. And let's be honest, for most of us, we don't get close to Valentine's Day before we run out of gas. And so the covenant service, this is how J.D. Walt describes it, it's about considering some different questions. What if we started out this year on our knees? Reminding one another of the mercy, grace, and faithfulness of God. What if we gave up on reaching for the stars and instead found ourselves bowing down to the ground before the one true and living God? So that's the heart that we want to live into in these weeks and as we prepare for the service that we're going to share on February 5th. And so again, I'm going to read to you that prayer that John Wesley wrote, again, that was repeated annually in the context of this service in just a moment. But I want to begin with this passage from John chapter 15. Listen to these words of Jesus spoken on the night that he was betrayed by his disciples. The night before he was crucified, he said this, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So keep this image in your mind, what Jesus is describing here, himself as the vine and each of us as the branches that must remain connected to him if we desire for our life to bear fruit. And with that in mind, hear these words of the Wesley Covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering, let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. 
I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. So again, we have this picture of Jesus as the vine, as each of us as the branches that must remain connected to the vine if we are to bear fruit in our lives. And we have this prayer from Wesley that culminates in a single word, a word you've already heard mentioned, the word covenant. Now, covenant is not a word that we commonly use in our everyday language. What we uh, do instead is we use words that sort of have a similar meaning, So, for example, we we would typically use the word commitment. Well, we would talk about our commitments, and one of the things that I think we all can agree on is that commitments are important. We believe that commitments are important, especially those commitments that other people have made to us. We think those are really important, right? We think that they're important. That's that's something that we share together. Out of this sense that they are important to us, we believe that they are a priority in our life, that we should, as best we can, live into our commitments. We believe that they are a priority, but we don't necessarily believe that they are primary to our life. And here's why. We talked about this last week. The constant refrain of our culture is that the most important thing in your life is finding happiness in your life. The message that is constantly reinforced for you and for me is that the purpose of our lives is to get what we want out of our lives. Here's how author Pete Davis expresses it in his book, Commitment. He says, the dominant culture tells us not to get too sentimental about anything, It's better, he writes, to stay distant, to not hold true to anything too seriously, and to not be surprised when others don't either. So again, we believe that commitments are important. We are not people who would easily walk away from those, and yet we experience this tension in our life because every commitment in your life will eventually confront you in your sin. And when we are confronted in our sin, in a world that constantly teaches and reinforces the idea that your life is about being happy, that it's about getting what you want out of life, it's very easy for us to walk away from that commitment, to step away from that commitment. And as a result of this tension between the commitments that we believe in and the happiness, the satisfaction that we ourselves seek, As a result of that tension in our world today, as important as they are, we expect commitments to be temporary. We tend towards the thinking that relationships are inherently transactional. We assume that love, the foundation of all relationship, we assume that it is contingent upon agreement. And so when we find ourselves pulling away from one another, disagreeing with one another, we assume that the relationship must be sacrificed. And when things get hard, perhaps this is the most important thing as we think about the tension between the dominant narrative of our world and and the the world uh, uh, that, that the Bible speaks of. When things get hard, we assume that something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong because this thing in my life, this circumstance in my life, this relationship in my life has suddenly become hard. And as a result of that, there's work that needs to be done. The problem needs to be identified. And unfortunately, most often what that looks like is we have to find someone else to blame for the problem in our life, for the hardship that we are experiencing. Because we live in a world where this message is constantly reinforced for you and for me And as you think about what we're going to talk about on Friday night, what Shane's going to share, for our kids as well, a world that constantly reinforces that happiness is our goal, that comfort should be our primary value, that individual the freedom, the freedom to do what we believe is best for ourselves, that has become our idol 
a false God that we are continually encouraged to serve. And so this word covenant is not one that we use on a regular basis. We settle for a word that we think of as similar, and yet in our thinking about it, the understanding of covenant further devolves, and we begin to think about our commitments like we think about contracts. And in a contract, of course, the focus is on making sure that the other person, the other party, lives up to their end of the deal. In a contract, we tend to invest the minimum, (laughs) towards our own uh, responsibilities because we assume that the other will do the same. There is a posture of skepticism that we live into uh, because uh, we're not quite sure that we're going to get what we have been promised. And so we give as long as we get, as, uh, and, and when we find the other falling short in that, or we perceive that they are not doing their part, serious, serious conflict ensues. Conflict that isn't solved quickly or easily, but conflict that is deep and can be quite painful. I I, I sincerely believe that all conflict comes from unmet expectations. And when we live our lives thinking about our circumstances or our relationships as contracts, we fill them with all sorts of expectations. And when those are not met, conflict quickly ensues. But listen again to how Jesus describes a relationship with him. John 15, four through five, from a different translation, he says this, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit uh, by itself unless you abide in the vine, uh, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Again, abide, not a word that we would normally use. Remain is one that we're more familiar with. Abide simply means to make a home. Jesus is essentially saying this, make a home in me as I make my home in you. This is the gospel. This is the good news. We find it throughout the New Testament proclaimed over and over and over again that Jesus made a home among us so that we might find a home in him. And this is the mission of the church. This is what we ourselves are committed to in our relationship with one another. We are invested personally and we are about encouraging and equipping one another towards this primary aim, making a home in Jesus as Jesus is making his home in us. Now consider with me the difference between thinking about our lives, thinking about our our commitments as contracts, and, and, and what it means to live in covenant relationship with God. How Jesus describes the relationship here in John 15. Instead of a posture of skepticism, we are called to a life of complete trust. A life that says, a heart that says, I can trust God today, I can trust God tomorrow. I can trust God when what I want to have happen finally happens, and I can trust God when what I don't want to have happen happens. I can trust God on good days and on bad days, on the mountaintop and in the valley. In each and every circumstance of my life, I can live in complete trust of God because of my understanding of God's love for me, God's claim over my life as a son as a daughter, instead of focusing on personal gain, we are called in a covenantal relationship to continually ask, what must I give? We live in response to grace, abundant and overflowing in our life. And so the question out of our appreciation, our love, is what must I give? Over and over again, what must I give? Rather than limiting our exposure, which is our natural human inclination, The challenge of discipleship is a life of increasing vulnerability that is grounded in radical faith in Jesus. Instead of the minimum requirements, discipleship is a life of extravagant love. Consider the difference between seeing life as a collection of contracts and commitments that we make 
and what it means to live in covenantal relationship, the relationship that Jesus describes here in John 15, where he is making a home in us as we are making a home in him. Uh, this Christmas, uh, we, we got to welcome my, my cousin's family to our house, which is, which is a, a big deal. It's, it's a year that we really appreciate. Uh, he and his wife, Jessica, they live in Arkansas. They live uh, north of Fayetteville, if you're familiar with the University of Arkansas. And they live south of Bentonville, if you're familiar with Walmart. Okay, that's kind of what that area is about. Uh, Jessica's from Wisconsin. Uh, Clint lived in Wisconsin for, for quite some time, and so they met there. So every other year they come here to Texas, God's country, and every other year they go to Wisconsin, not God's country, okay? And we, and we continually encourage them, why would you go to Wisconsin in December? You know, you want to come here where it's nice, but, but they want to go see our family. So we only get them every other year, but we're really excited when they come uh, and stay with us. Clint and Jessica have three boys. Their oldest son is named Christian, and he's in fifth grade. Their middle son is named Israel. He is in fourth grade. And their youngest son is named Judah, and he is in second grade. And when they were younger, Israel and Judah didn't get along very well. <laughs> but we thought that was their parents' fault. They, they, they set that up. So every other year, they come and stay with us for, for more than a few days. They stay with us for about a week. And again, it's something that we look forward to on those years that they were able to make that trip to, to see us. But that being said, the home that we live in, which we also love, we've been there 14 years, it isn't designed for, to accommodate not only our family of four and our two dogs, but also two more adults and, of course, three young boys. It's just not the way that it was built. It's not the way that it was made. And so adjustments must be made in order to accommodate them, which we, we want to do. There are things in the house that have to be moved to another place to accommodate them. There's, there's changes, modifications that are necessary. Some people don't get to sleep in the bed where they would normally sleep. The availability of the bathroom is significantly reduced. And schedules must be adapted accordingly. We need a lot more food than we normally do. And we need different food. They eat differently than everyone else. They're like aliens among us, these three young boys. <laughs> the living room is going to be more cluttered than normal. And it will remain so through the entirety of their stay. And I, for one, I just have to get used to that. And just Not everyone will get their regular seat on the couch. It's, it's more difficult than you might think. The overall noise level in our house will be elevated and will stay at that higher decibel for the entirety of their stay. We go through a lot more coffee than we normally would. And here's, here's perhaps the most important thing. We, we don't ask people to sign a waiver, but we should. <laughs> because during this period of time, while they are there, you have to live with the assumption that at any particular moment, you might get hit in the face by a stray Nerf bullet by a stray Nerf bullet, which sometimes leads you to spill your coffee, which again is why we need more coffee. We enjoy having them because we love them. But here's something that we always know heading into that. They're gonna go home. This is part of the deal, it's part of the expectation. We, we know that we will be temporarily inconvenienced but eventually they're gonna pack up the van, they're gonna say their goodbyes, and they're gonna go home. So moving things around for a short period of time, adjusting our schedule, the limitations on the bathroom, all of those things, the, those are not, they're, they're a manageable sacrifice. But a life with Jesus is so much more. This is where the illustration breaks down. Because you can't just temporarily relocate a few things to make room for him. There are things in your life that you simply have to get rid of if the primary purpose of your life is making a home in Jesus as Jesus is making his home in you. There are things that simply cannot stay. 
They, 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 must be, they must be taken out of your life, removed from your life. If Jesus is going to make a home in you and you are going to make a home in him. Because every commitment in our life eventually confronts our sin. And at some point in our life, we have to decide what's going to win. An allegiance to ourselves or an allegiance to Jesus as Lord. So, Foxy, this is why I wanted your music. You've heard these words already, but I want you to hear them again. Let me see if I can find them. I don't really read music here. The song is a, is a prayer for deliverance from the fear of having nothing. From a life of worldly passions. And listen to this one. From the need to be understood. From the need to be accepted. From the fear of being lonely. The prayer is deliver me, O God. The, the confession is, I shall not want. I want to live and surrender to you. So in just a moment, we're gonna pray this prayer, and here's, here's what I want you to hear. I, I trust your sincerity. I trust that if you speak these words, these words are coming from the sincerity of your own heart, that you do desire to live in this relationship with Jesus, a covenantal relationship, where you are willing to lose all things for his sake. But in my own experience, this is what I've learned. I often don't know what it is that is standing in the way of me living a life that fulfills this prayer. I often need help identifying that. We're gonna talk about that next week in terms of community and the, the, the need for relationships. But I also need, maybe it's just me, I don't know, but I need the Holy Spirit to convict me on what those things are. I need the Holy Spirit to speak into my life and to identify what it is that I'm holding on to that for whatever reason I find myself unwilling to let go. And so for just a moment before we pray this prayer, I wanna invite you just to consider what that might be in your life, something you may have never considered before. Again, I trust your sincerity but I know that we all need wisdom. So consider what it, what, it, what it might be. Might it be your own understanding of significance? The accomplishment that you've been pursuing for quite some time, that you're waiting to see realized in your life. Maybe you find yourself in a place where you haven't said it out loud, but part of what bothers you is you haven't gotten to the place that you thought you would be at this time in your life and you're still holding on to that dream that hope that idea maybe it is a sense of security maybe you find yourself pushing back when whatever it is that gives you that sense of security feels threatened in any way maybe it's a false assumption that is guiding your life, a, a, an unchallenged belief that continually undermines your life. You find yourself stumbling over and over again and you can't even see what it is that you keep tripping over. Maybe it's an addiction in your life that you continue to tell yourself, I can figure this out, it's gonna be okay, I'm going to get better but you've not gotten to the place of saying, I think I need help. And I need to tell someone that I need help. A, a habitual behavior that just, it goes unrecognized. Others might be able to see it in your life, but you've not been able to see it yourself. A relationship that maybe has grown toxic. It needs to be dealt with in a way that maybe you're not willing to face yet. Maybe it is a hurt in your life that has not been healed. And sometimes the reason that hurt isn't healed in our life is as the spirit moves in us and seeks to bring healing, we resist it. We say, no, I don't want you to mess with that. I don't want you to do anything with that. 
Maybe it's a hurt that you're not even willing to write down. When, when you feel perhaps that, that, that pressing from the spirit, you just find yourself saying, no, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I don't even want to write it down. I don't want to acknowledge that it's something that I've gone through in my life that I need to be healed from. Maybe it's a need to be right. That's where you've planted your flag. I'm not budging an inch till they say what I want them to say, till they do what I want them to do. And the fruit of that is a heart that has been poisoned by unforgiveness. And it's just time to let it go. Because maybe what you want to have happen is never going to happen. Maybe the words that you want to hear spoken are never going to be spoken. And it's just time to let it go. Because it's poisoning your heart. It's undermining your life. It's poisoning your soul. We're going to pray these words. And I don't doubt your sincerity. But today, and in the days to come, what I want to encourage you to do is pray for wisdom. Spirit, help me understand what it is that needs to be emptied. What it is that I need to let go. That I can live in this covenantal relationship with you. Where you are everything. And I am willing to be nothing. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to a time of prayer. We're going to pray this prayer together, and I'm going to invite, you'll see it on the screen, but I'm going to invite you just to repeat after me so that we can pray it together slowly, and this will be our closing prayer together. And these words, again, our, our hope is that they'll continue to seep into our soul as we prepare to share in a special service together at the beginning of February. Let us pray, and would you repeat after me? I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. for you Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Thank you, Pastor David. The power of the Wesleyan Covenant prayer continues in all of our lives. And before Scott leads us in our closing hymn, just a few reminders before we leave worship today. And if I haven't met you yet, I'm Jan Davis, one of the pastors here on staff. What a delight. It always is to worship with you. If you're interested in making a gift today, there's a slide on the screen that shows ways to give. You can scan the QR code on the back of the pew, visit one of our drop boxes outside this worship space, or go to our online bulletin. Your gifts matter to God. They matter to this church and enable us to fulfill the ministry. If you did not receive an FYI guide for January, please get one on your way out. Please, there's so many things kicking off right now. As David mentioned, as our video showed, please take this opportunity to get involved in the life of the church, in fellowship, and in community. 
If you um, want to help in that, in next steps, please go to our connecting point after the service. And if you're new today, please fill out a connection card because we want to connect with you. And if you would like prayer after the service, the pastors will be here in front of the sanctuary. If you'd like us to pray for you or someone you love, we would love to pray with you. Or if you just want to come and touch base, um, sometimes people just want to come talk to us. I hope you will do so. Now invite Scott to please come lead us in our closing hymn. As a response to praying the Wesley Covenant prayer, let us stand together and sing, I am thine, O Lord. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard. And it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Drawing nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Drawing nearer, 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 blessed Lord. Thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast. Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer with thee, my God, I commune and I hope that you have been drawn near to the heart of God as we've gathered together today, and I pray that you will continue to feel that nearness as we leave this place and go out in the world to serve in the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Go in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.